three of our Heroes sermon series, we're taking a look at this man, this man by the name of Daniel. And what we've been doing for the past three weeks is we've been taking a look at both men and women who were great in God's eyes. And the premise of this entire sermon series has really been that of it doesn't really take <clears throat> like what we see in the world to be great. That's not what makes people great in God's eyes. In God's eyes, what makes people great are different subtle things. Things like, for example, when we talked about King David, we talked about his heart of worship. And then last week, we talked, when we talked about Ruth, we talked about her kindness, the kindness that was in her heart. And this week, we want to talk about faithfulness and integrity. You know, it's not these great things, these great things that men and women do that make, that make them great in God's eyes. It's really these small little things. And so today, as we talk about heroes, I want to talk about the training of a hero and what trained Daniel to be the hero that he ultimately was. And it's interesting that <clears throat> I didn't plan this. Uh, this was kind of serendipitous that uh, of all the weeks that we go through this sermon, uh, what's been the biggest thing talked about in today's day and age or this past two weeks? The Olympics. Very good. Very good. Uh, everyone has been talking about the Paris 2024 Olympics. And I found it really funny that, you know, this, there were some memes that were going out with that Korean, South Korean shooter, you know, the, the, with a gun and her, the, the way she stood, her stance. She became an overnight sensation, right? Uh, probably to her chagrin, because during a press conference, I heard she fainted like a day ago, like she fainted because of exhaustion. Uh, there are other people that are gaining notoriety, but the most funniest part of this whole Olympics to me was the breakdancing part. That to me was the most funniest part. I don't know about you, but there's this new, there's this woman from Australia by the name of Ray Gunn, and if you saw her dance, I mean, she became an overnight YouTube sensation. Like, everyone's talking about her, not in the best way, but in, like, the most, you know, embarrassing way possible. Because when I saw her routine, I mean, she literally looked like she was, like, spazzing out of, like, you know, ulcers or something in her stomach. Um, I don't know how they judge the, the breakdancing. I really don't know how it goes. But there's a lot that's been talked about in 2024 Olympics. But did you know that 100 years ago, that there was a man that was talked about a lot in the 1924 Olympics in Paris, and his name was Eric Liddell. I don't know if you know his story, but he's a son of a missionary. And Eric Liddell was actually, this man here was a devout Christian. And he was known as the Flying Scotsman. He was so fast that he was actually favored to win the gold medal in the 100 meter race. Now, the person, it's just like today, uh, a couple years ago, it was Usain Bolt that was favored to win. Now we saw Noah Lyles, he won the 100 meters. In the same way, this gentleman, Eric Liddell, was the clear favorite to win the 100 meter race. However, they, he found out later that the race, his favorite race, actually landed on a Sunday. And because of his faithfulness, because of Liddell's faithfulness to his religious beliefs he, and his religious convictions, he actually said he will not compete in the 100-meter race because it was on a Sunday. And he didn't want to dis, you know, he didn't want to um, take the Lord's name in vain. And he wanted to be faithful to the Lord. And this, despite all the pressure from the British Olympic Committee, all the people, you know, his teammates, the public, everyone was telling Liddell, dude, it's just a race. You're going to win the gold medal. You got to run. 
and even and all of Britain was pressuring him to run. However, in the midst of that pressure, he stood by his belief. And because Sunday was a day of rest <clears throat> and worship, he decided that he would not violate that principle. Well, if everybody knows how the story goes, and this is where the movie Chariots of Fire was actually made after him. Um, instead of compromising his own beliefs, Liddell actually switched from the 100-meter race to the 400-meter race. Now, mind you, he was not favored at all for the 400. And if you take a look at the Olympics, you'll notice that uh, 100 meters and 200 meters makes a big difference, vast difference, um, and so forth and so forth. And so remarkably, however, Liddell actually won the gold medal in the 400 meters. And not only did he win the gold medal, he set a new world record. And because of his faith, because of his testimony, because of the testimony of his integrity, I mean, this news just went out all over throughout Paris. And this was 100 years ago. And now we can see through his story today that Eric Liddell's story is a powerful example to all of us of how faithfulness and integrity can actually guide us even while facing significant pressure to compromise, especially in today's day and age. His decision to prioritize his faith over worldly success mirrors Daniel's unwavering commitment to his beliefs. And despite all the risks that were involved, uh, <clears throat> Liddell's story encourages you and I to both hold fast to our convictions and to trust God. To trust that God will honor those who honor him. And so with that being said, I want us to all open up our Bibles. Uh, but, and, and before we do, I want to just say this quote to show how different the 200 and the, uh, the 100 and the 400 is. He said, the secret of my success over the 400 meters is that I run the first 200 meters as fast as I can. Then for the second 200 meters, with God's help, I run faster. I love this quote because what Liddell is saying, and that he was telling this to a reporter who was asking, Liddell, you, you're not a... You're not a 400 meter runner. How did you do so well? And he gave the glory to God by saying that there's a part that we do our best. And then there's also a part where you have to leave it to God to do the rest. And I think this is a really good principle in our life where there's a portion where it's our responsibility to do certain things to the best of our ability as Christians. We're called to excellent work. However, the results have to be left to God. We don't control the results. He does. And so I really love this quote. <clears throat> and so through today's text, we're going to see, once again, this hero by the name of Daniel, who was not really born a hero. Daniel was not born a hero. I believe heroes in the Bible are made. And that's actually good news for you and I, because that means that we're not born into this excellency of Christianity. It's actually made through our practices, spiritual disciplines, and things of that like. So let's open up our Bible this morning to see what the text has to say about faithfulness and integrity as we open up to Daniel chapter 1, and we see the context of Daniel's life. I'm going to read specifically in verses 3 to 5, and then we'll, I'll park it right there to talk about the context. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, 
handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Uh, <clears throat> right here, starting from the beginning of Daniel chapter 1, when we look at the life of Daniel, we see the context of this passage is actually when Israel, and that's where Daniel is from, Israel was under Babylonian rule. The Babylonians had captured Israel, took them over, and <clears throat> the king Nebuchadnezzar was the king at the time that took over Israel. He besieged, he besieged Jerusalem and took Daniel and all these other young Israelites into captivity. Now, as you see here in the text, you notice that they now, after taking over a land, they were starting to educate the young men and women. Why do nations that conquer other nations do this? Well, if anybody knows history, the reason why nations, when they conquer other nations, they actually try to make them learn their language, to learn their language, to learn their history, because what are they trying to do? In order to conquer a land, they are trying to bring those people enslaved under their power. And one of the greatest ways to do this, to take them under their wing, is to teach them, make them forget their own language and teach them their language, the Babylonian language, so that they would forget, you know, they would forget, the, Jew the Jewish people would forget who they are. And so it is in this context that we find that Daniel, we notice that he is couple of things about him. He's young, right? Quick to understand. He was good looking, handsome. There was not a blemish in his body, according to this text. And he was handpicked to become one of the new vassals for this Babylonian empire. And so one of the things they did was make sure that they learn their language and they do the things the way they indoctrinate young men and women to, you know, with their own beliefs, with the Babylonian beliefs, and introduce those who are in captivity a new way of life. This is the context of Daniel's life. But what ends up happening is as he was being forced to eat their food, learn their language, look at what Daniel does as a young man, in verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Then I'm going to jump to verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. <clears throat> so the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. <clears throat> this is quite amazing because in the face of opposition, in the face of enemy opposition, Daniel decides to make a stand. He says, I am not going to eat the king's food. And he's young, by the way. And if, and if any person, young person, was found disobeying the king, you can be beheaded. That was a death sentence. And so Daniel knew from a young age, he knew that this could get him killed. But what do we see about his young life, this young man's life? We see that he would not compromise himself with the things of this new world. And he decided that he is not going to eat the food that the king is feeding all these other young men. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to fatten himself up. And look at what it says in verse 15 after he makes this decision. After the end of the 10 days, they actually looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. See, similar to an Olympian training for a gold medal, 
Daniel is seen training himself, training his body to stay steady in the midst of shaky times through his convictions, through his convictions. Ladies and gentlemen, we do live in a day and age where the times are shaky. They're very shaky. As a matter of fact, um, <clears throat> just recently, I, I got into a conversation with a gentleman, uh, you know, in Dallas. Uh, I went to go to Dallas a couple of weeks ago, and um, I met this gentleman, and we were having conversation about the end times. And it was very interesting what this person had to say. He was so nervous about Jesus coming back. He's like, oh, man, you know, all this stuff. I'm worried that Jesus is going to come back. And with all this stuff with the, the, the political news, with Trump and with Har Kamala Harris and everything that's happening in our world, like he was so nervous, so nervous that, I, you know, I, I was kind of shocked, quite honestly. And I asked him, you know, so what's making you nervous? And I realized more and more as I was listening to this person, you know, speak, I realized that he had no firm conviction. There was no conviction in his life. And I asked him, look, yes, I agree with you, Jesus is coming back. As to when the day he's coming back, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that I'm a child of Jesus. And I asked him, are you? And he said, yeah, I, I, I'm a child of Jesus. Then I said, what are you afraid of? What are you so afraid of? Because if he's coming back, he's going to, like it says in Revelation, he's coming back to bring you back into his bosom, into his arms, into the heavenly kingdom. What are you so afraid of? And then as we started to uncover that, that's when I started realizing, oh, yes, he has Jesus as his Lord and Savior, but there were so many things of the world that he loved. And he didn't want to let it go. And you realize more and more that I, I just started realizing more and more as I was listening to this gentleman talk, I realized that he still, his convictions are still on the things that are temporary, not on eternal things things. And Daniel here, whether he was going to be executed for not following the rules, his conviction was so, was so based, so fundamental to his life that he would risk his own life for this. And so this is what we call in the Christian life, Christian training. This is Daniel's training ground. Just like for any Olympian who wins a gold, who's, who's seeking to win a gold medal, you don't just become a gold medal winner overnight. Sure, you may be born with great talent, you may be born with great speed, but you know what? That doesn't give you the, that doesn't give you the gold medal. What gives you the gold medal is the hours and hours of training, day after day, seasons after seasons. You notice that in the, the Olympics, nobody ever talks about all the nights, the days and the nights that these Olympians trained. During, you know, when everybody else is sleeping at 4 a.m. in the morning, these guys are waking up to their alarm clock, getting out into, you know, the, the sw to swim laps when nobody else is swimming laps. These are the people that make, you know, that, that make themselves great. They pull themselves apart from others by making themselves great, by doing the things that no one else is doing. In the same way, Daniel is seen doing here what no one else is doing. While everybody else is eating the grand food that's being offered to them, as everybody else is being indoctrinated by the Babylonian education system, Daniel, we see here, he stays away from the food. And he says, I'm not going to eat that, and ends up actually looking healthier than the people who were eating the king's food. And when we start to train ourselves in discipline, when we do the things that nobody else is willing to do, day in and day out, you know what that actually produces? It comes out in the next verses. Look at what it says in verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge 
and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole entire kingdom. What most spectators don't see is the daily grind of a trained athlete. And what they go through to get to participate for that final race. And just as an athlete trains every day for their craft in increments uh, for the final race, you and I as Christians, we too have must, we have to train for the final race that is ahead of both you and I. For example, there are many ways we can train as Christians. There's, crane, there's training in prayer. There's training by learning God's word. Um, there's also training by worshiping the Lord. Um, those are three major ways that Christians can train for this final heat that's going to come up in our lives. For example, prayer. Now, I know that many of us really, um, it's very difficult to pray, especially in a, like, let's say, like, some, for some of us, the beginning of the year, we always start with things like, hey, I'm going to start by praying every single day this year. And then you get to like the second week of January and you're like, oh man, I forgot to pray the last few days. And then by February, March, you're you kind of like forgotten the whole thing, right? Um, many times we end up praying when things are pressed upon us. And that is actually a terrible way to run a race. You can't, you can't ask somebody, you may see somebody with real natural talent and say, hey, look, like, let's say Noah Lyles, that guy who won the 100, he's been talked about a lot because of that whole COVID thing. But regardless, let's say someone just found him on the streets and this kid could run really fast. Well, you don't just put that kid on the track for the 100 meters. No, you actually have to, he has to go under rigorous training. Many times, God will put situations in your life and my life where it's very uncomfortable. And we're almost kind of like put on a track where we have to make decisions. And sometimes God will put the heat under our lives so that we may be able to start this training regimen. One of the things that I, I find in my own life that God does over and over again is through prayer. Have you guys ever find a time in your life where you feel like everything is just collapsing under you and you say things like, oh God, why now? Why now? Have you ever been there? I've been there so many times. And now as I'm more, as I'm getting older and older, I'm starting to see why God does this. He's doing this to train us so that when the big event comes, you and I are not found surprised or, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. But we're found more like set in our, uh, set with our, a peaceful heart, knowing that, oh, I've seen this. I've been through this before and I know what to do at this moment. That's what God does many times in our lives. And that's what God's doing here in Daniel's life. He's training him so that when the big race comes, he's ready for it. And do you know that there is a big race that Daniel's going to face? And that's actually found in Daniel chapter 6. What's Daniel's final test? Well, in Daniel chapter 6, many of you guys might know this story already. <clears throat> I want to read to you from verses 6 through 9 to give you the context of what's happening in Daniel's final test. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days 
except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue this decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. What this is, what this is pointing to is that Daniel actually in time, because he was par excellence better than anybody else found in the kingdom, there were a lot of officials in King Darius's court who was jealous of Daniel. They were so jealous of him, they wanted to find a way to kill him because of his integrity and because of his faithfulness could not be wavered. And so they tried to kill him by coming up with this plan and saying, listen, King Darius, you're the awesome king. You are who everybody should be praying to. So we're going to put up a law that if there's anybody who prays to any other god other than you, King Darius, they're going to be executed. And so King Darius, of course, you know, he's all pompous and he's feeling like, yeah, this is a great thing. Everybody should be praying to me. So then they put this into law and put it into effect. And then the very next day, this is what happens. <clears throat> now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. See, similar to the story like Eric Liddell, when Daniel learned of this new law that could put him in jail, his decision, Daniel's decision, what he decided to do, showed the entire world what was truly in his heart. See, the whole world told Eric Liddell, yeah, that's your favorite race. You're going to win the 100. Well, you're going to have to do it on a Sunday. And Eric Liddell, I mean... He showed the entire world at Paris, 100 years ago, he showed the entire world that his heart did not chase after gold medals. But his heart was chasing after God. And in the same way, Daniel, where the whole, the, the whole um, the Babylonian kingdom issued a decree and said, Daniel, if you pray to any other god other than King Darius, you are going straight to the lion's den. You're going to die. And at that moment, Daniel showed the entire world where his heart belonged. He gave his own life. He was willing to sacrifice his own life to stay true to the God he served. And what does it say? That three days he went upstairs. As soon as this decree was issued, he goes upstairs to his room, opens the window towards Jerusalem, and he prays to God three times a day and says, God, I trust in you. He does his part. He does his part with excellence. But he can't refute or argue against the law. And then so he says, God, you must now do your part. And there are situations in our life, ladies and gentlemen, where we're going to find that we are going to have to make this difficult decision. Do you go with what the world tells you? Do you go with what everybody else is thinking? Do you go with that? Or do you go with what God tells you to do? And so Daniel goes by what God tells him to do. And so what does it do? What, the, what do they do? So the king gives the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king says to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. And we know the story. They throw, him into the Daniel, they throw Daniel into the lion's den. And then that night, the king is so distressed, he couldn't even sleep. So it says in Scripture that, you know, King Darius was so distressed that, uh, about his situation that the king could not eat nor sleep. And he gets up at the break of dawn. As soon as the light hits 
the, the horizon, he gets up and he says, Daniel, are you okay? Are you, are you living or are you dead? And then Daniel says in verse 22, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. You know, from our scripture today, what made Daniel a hero was not that he did great things. He wasn't this overpowering, really strong man who went into that lion's den and like shut all the mouths of the lions. He didn't wrestle them all night. All this man Daniel did was he, he gave his life to prayer. And he said, God, I'm in this situation it's a very difficult one, you know it, but I am going to stay true to you. And that was the spiritual discipline he learned all throughout his life from a young boy when he was chosen and he decided not to eat the food, but to depend on God, all the way to where he is now an older man now, needing help because the law was set against him. He decided to stay true to the Lord and he prayed and asked God for help, and that is where God comes in and he helps him in his time of trouble. I pray for each and every one of us when we face these hurdles in our life, that you and I would be stay, would, that you and I would have the heart and the head and the mindset to stay true to the Lord, to stay lockstep with him, and to trust in him so that he may be able to bring us through out into, this, um, into the blessings that he has for each and every one of us. Let's pray this morning, everybody. Let's bow down our heads and pray.